What I did last week, when I wasn't with you, was I laid down some very, very basic uh, concepts. So I want this to be something, I don't know if this will manifest into more messages, but I'm at least trying to lay down a foundation for those people and listen carefully to what I'm going to say. There are a thousand plus voices out there asking for money. I have not heard one singular voice teaching how, why, and the reasons underneath it. I am an analytical person, and I believe if you give people information, they should be able to do with it what they feel led to do. But if they don't have the information, all that's happening is fundraising, and I can't even call it that. It's really quite disgusting to me when I see people who are begging for money and the, the type of concept that I want to completely avoid, which is why I said I'm going to lay down spiritual breadcrumbs. So this message will be reinforcement for those who have listened for as many years as you've been here, but also for those people who I'm going to say may be on a spiritual plateau. Because the concept of giving and stewardship can also get very dry for some people, almost becomes robotic. We don't want that. Now, I was traveling last week, and I was in a hurry after I left here to grab a Bible, a, a small Bible, not this one. And I mistakenly, so I thought, picked up a King James Bible. But in fact, I left with an NIV. And at first, when I first discovered that, I was like, oh. Not that, there's nothing wrong with the NIV, but I use the King James. But actually, God had a better plan, and I didn't know it. So I just out of curiosity went back to the scripture that I started last week's message with, which I don't think I need to, I, I don't even need to look in my King James. The verse is, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and the inhabitants them that dwell in the earth, basically. But when I pulled up the King James, I mean the NIV, see if I wrote it down, because this, by the way, is very small print. <laughs> I looked like Oracle last week. <laughs> All right. So Psalm 24, 1 from the NIV says, the earth is the Lord's, get this, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So I'm going to ask you something. Now, King James is, I love it. But this is kind of like, if you didn't understand the king's English, I think you're going to understand this. It means everything belongs to him. That is a hard concept. So let me ask what it should mean for you and for me. Either one believes this or not, and it's just that cut and dry. You either believe that God created everything, it all belongs to him. We are living, you know the expression, you live on borrowed time? No, you're living on stewardship time. And he decides the time. Just as the breath in your lungs, your ability to function, think, make money, spend money, your health, everything. Now, there are people that they don't recognize that, and there are subcategories. So let me just say, there are also those people out there listening who will be like the verse that says, only the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I, by the way, had the luxury of speaking to such a one last week, trying to tell me that it's impossible that God created everything because everything evolved. OK, well, if that's the case, my dear friend, I'd like to know why things are not still evolving. In fact, we're going backwards, OK? So save that for someone else who drank the Kool-Aid. But in any event, <laughs> this diplomacy hour here. When it comes to giving stewardship and human responsibility, there are really only two groups of people, and I want you to know that. You, you're seeing a pattern with me in the ministry, only two groups. The same thing here now. We've got people who give and people who don't. That's the first category. Now, once you get into the people who give, there's subsections. There are those who truly understand giving as a form of worship just as much as prayer and fasting and anything else. And they don't look at it as dollars and cents. They look at it as worship. And that is a proper way of looking at it. But then you'll get those people who, in that same subsection, will look at giving 
And it's almost like a necessary evil. You must do it, but gosh, I wish I didn't have to. That's in the category of people who give. Once more, let me bring this down to a, a closer category, which is those who look unto the Lord and see and understand what, I'm going to speak for me, I can see what I've been given. I can see what I've been afforded, but above all, I can see what has been sacrificed for me. So if you have that mindset, you're not going to back away from understanding everything you have is yours and giving essentially back to God is essentially recognizing Him in all things. Failure to do that, by the way, is kind of a bad starting point because you get into this concept of, I checked the box, and I don't think God is pleased with somebody just going through a rote mechanism in any capacity, just like prayer. We've talked about, I've taught on this before. This is why I say, let your prayers be spontaneous. Let them be real. Where the rubber meets the road, that's how you talk to God. Not in stained glass tones, not in repetitive cards that I can read. That means nothing. That is what the Bible says is vain repetition. So when people begin to get down to what I call the minutia, how to calculate, how to bring it all down, I think there's something missing. Now, last week I talked about the tithe is the Lord's. It's the Lord's tithe. And those people who will argue and say, well, well, the tithe is Old Testament, they are failing to recognize what the tithe really is. So the tithe is, yes, 10%. And as I pointed out last week, if you really want to go Old Testament, you're going to get up somewhere in about the 30% mark if you're really looking at what the tithe is and all the tithes that go with it. Now, we live in a New Testament dispensation, so it's very, very difficult when you begin to talk about giving. People, the first thing people will do is argue that the tithe is law in Old Testament. The failure on the part of those individuals is to not recognize that the tithe is actually a concept. It's recognition of what actually God says, look, you give me a portion, I bless the rest. Failure to do that is saying, God has no part. God didn't involve himself in my success or my failures. It's all me. I did it. Now you sound like the children of Israel. It's my hand that gave me the capacity to gain wealth, not God. So the reason why I thought I'm going to go over this real slowly is because the Bible says very clearly, in fact, I thought it was funny, I'm so accustomed to the King James, which says you cannot serve God and mammon, then when I opened up the NIV, it's as plain as day. You cannot serve God and money. Plain as day. You're going to pick one, and that's going to be your master. Now, there are some giants of the faith, like Spurgeon, and he basically kind of reduced this down to something very simple. Look at how and where you spend your money. This is not... This is not me looking at you. This is not me judging you. This is look at how you spend your money and where you spend your money and what you spend it on. It'll tell you a lot about yourself. We tend to look at others, but we don't tend to examine ourselves. So there's a big concept for us all, old and new believers alike, to just stop for a minute and say, what exactly or how exactly do I understand this concept? See, if there is some planet where people are actually teaching the Bible, find me one, you'll find a great caricature on how money should be understood. Now, I am a big believer on this. I believe that people can be blessed and they can have money. And God blesses those people who he knows the money doesn't possess them, that they understand it belongs to him. Show me a person who is as tight-fisted with their money like this, pockets are closed. I will also show you an individual whose heart is closed. It is, these things go hand in hand. I used to think, before I really got into digging in the Bible years and years ago, that you could just say, this is what God desires, you give. But in reality, I found out that there are people even who give. They still have somewhat of a closed heart. They are not generous people. They just do it because it's a box for them to check. This is the thing I want us all to avoid. 
So don't say I'm sending you double messages here. Well, you talk about the tithe and you're talking about not being uh, held back. I'll explain. If you give me a chance, I'll explain. But for those people who are still arguing about money, I'm going to tell you, I wrote this down, and I've got to say this the right way. If you believe what the Bible says, how on the day of Pentecost, which, by the way, was intended to be a harvest of souls, which is still ongoing, until God says the harvest is over, he is still harvesting souls. The Holy Spirit was poured out on that day for a purpose, not to be played around with like a light switch on and off, but rather to guide, to direct, to instruct, to impress, to help, to remind us of things that are in the Bible, just like the disciples. So it's important that I say this the right way. There are a lot of people who don't understand that giving is a spiritual aspect that is intrinsically tied to your faith. Failure to grab hold of that is what Romans 8 says. If the Spirit of God is not in you, you are none of His. Now, this will explain why some people come into the church, not just this church, any church. They're fascinated by the message, but you'll never see them give. They will never give of money or time. They don't really have that capacity. Why? You might say, well, didn't the Spirit of God bring them? Possibly but the Spirit of God is not working in them. And why do I say this? Because God's Spirit changes people from the inside, and I see a lot of what I call fake fruit. It's something on the outside that everyone can see, but nothing has happened on the inside. I'm nobody's judge. You are to work out your faith. That's between you and Him. But when it comes down to giving, I'm going to say this aright. Giving does not start in the wallet. It does not start in the purse or the pocketbook. Giving starts when God begins to change your heart, that changes your mind, that changes the way you see the world, the people around you, and everything in it to recognize the earth is the Lord's. It does belong to Him. I belong to Him. I was bought with a price. The minute I became blood-bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, something else changed in me. Now, for some people, that change is very slow and very difficult. But God is going to change a heart. If you look at all the people that we've encountered and we've studied in the New Testament, God's Word will do one of two things. It will either bring illumination, understanding. You will want to draw close. Or you will be like one that I'll talk about soon, the rich young ruler who basically checked the boxes. I've done all these things from my youth. I've kept the law. I've done this, this, and that. Jesus says one thing you lack. It wasn't that Jesus was giving a message to the world saying, get rid of your money. It was God who sees each and every heart and knows what's operating inside, knew that that man was not willing to part with his riches. It was the one thing holding him back. Now, for some people here, it could be money. For some people, it could be replace the money with something else that's holding you back. And that's the one thing that God will say, basically, impressed upon your heart, get rid of that. If you don't want to get rid of it, chances are you're more affectionate to that than you are to God and His Word. We have an impasse then. Now, I am not trying to coerce people today. This is not, I'm not raising money today. Unfortunately, there have been so many people who have been poorly taught on the subject of giving that they think periodic giving, for example, non-consistent and period or sporadic giving is okay. When in fact, there's instructions in this book, in the New Testament, by the way, that say, we'll call it systemic and regular giving, all you've got to do is look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 when he says on the first day of the week, basically let each one lay aside. There is the systemic, regular, that's not spontaneous, okay? That's a regular, set, fixed time. But not a fixed amount as each one has prospered. What's in that person's heart? But if a person starts asking the question, well, how have I prospered? In what capacity? I don't have more this week than I had last week. You might have failed to understand the greater spiritual concept of giving. Am I better today 
in terms of my understanding, my proximity with God, my love for the Lord, than I was a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago? My answer is yes. So I realize right there, God is still changing Melissa Scott. He's still working on me. He's not finished with me. That opens up horizons for me to say, if God is not finished with me and he, he is continuously helping me to better understand his word, then I can also jump in to the place where it says God loves a hilarious giver, systemically and regular, but also spontaneous, without coercion. Now, how many of you have had exposure to some preacher, somebody talking, and it's pressure, it's coercion? Give, 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 and all you can do is go. <laughs> but the message has been missed. So let me step away for just about a minute, might be longer, to talk about this. If God's first act is to change the heart, to transform the heart, then it tells me I begin to see things differently, much like a John, son of thunder, turns into the disciple of love, an impetuous Peter who turns into the one who preaches the sermon on the day of Pentecost that birthed the church, to a Zacchaeus. We know he was probably a crook that turned into an honest man with an encounter with Christ. So it's very easy for me to say, do not miss the spiritual concept in giving and stewardship. There are more passages in the Bible, more verses that talk about this kind of concept than most people think. Well, well, just go to one scripture and they just camp out on that one thing. But as I said, in the New Testament, if you're looking back, the first place you put a marker on is what happened on the day of Pentecost. And that action, that activity of a harvest of souls is still ongoing. That means people are still being metamorphosed every single day. And probably every second of every hour, there's somebody coming to the faith, being illuminated that they were in the dark, they now see the light, and something changes to the person that said, I'd never give to a church, to now saying, what can I do? How can I help? It usually starts that way. It doesn't usually start with money. How can I help? What can I do? I really love this. And it builds, and it begins to build until the point where God's spirit in that person almost has to be held back. There used to be, I think I've told you the story, there used to be a man, he has been promoted, but he used to work in the VTR room, our old studio. And he always wore the same darn clothes. Now that's okay as long as you wash them, right? But you know, you get a regular paycheck and no one could figure out why this guy, as skinny as a rake, oh, never ate always got a regular paycheck and he never had any money. And one day I approached him and I kind of said, what's going on? Because I found out he was living over at the YMCA. And I'm thinking, this guy's getting paid. What the heck is he doing? Well, had I known this, I would have told him to stop because he was working and he was given all of his money, all of his paycheck. He took a little bit for him and the rest, he said, it has to go to the Lord. And had I known that, I would have told him, there's a passage in there, in, in the New Testament specifically, that says you're to take care of you and yours, you're not to neglect. But he had such an incredible spirit. Now that's taking it to the extreme. So as a pastor, I've seen, I've seen people, and I know people, they listen every single week, they'll tell me how great the message is, but they'll never give a dime. And I think to myself, oh, God might still be working. I'm not your judge. God may still be working on you. But at some point, you have to bifurcate this and say, it's not just about money. If a person does not have a generous spirit, they're closed. They will never help. They will never offer to help. They see someone who needs help. They will not offer. They will not assist. Because why? Their spirit is closed. They cannot. It is against everything that they hold so tightly. So I know this. I know that God does transform people. We know that Romans 12, which is one of, one of the many favorite scriptures here, God does the metamorphosing. He does the changing. If we will present ourselves as a living sacrifice, what he can do is something no one else and nothing else can do. I know, as I said, I stand as a testament before you to say, I have seen and nor do I stand here to tell you if you give, you're going to get. 
I, I, I got to say it, I loathe what a lot of these people on TV have done to Christianity. They have reduced it down to nothing but beggary and charlatanism that most people, once they hear somebody who actually is trying to teach, they even turn that off because they think there'll be, there'll be an appeal coming at the close. Well, let me just tell you something. My intent here is to lay a foundation for anyone who is curious that you can actually have reasons why. Just like we want to have reasons when somebody asks you why you came to the faith. Remember what the scripture says, be ready to give an answer in season, out of season. Be ready. That means you know, you have read, it's in your heart. You're not having to think. Giving should be the same way. Stewardship should be the same way. Human responsibility should be the same way. And unfortunately, it is not. Now, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 16.16 16 has a very interesting scripture. You can turn there or not. I'm not staying there long. This is a, the small Bible day. But Deuteronomy 16.16 16 basically says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before me, and they shall not, in the place that God chooses, and they shall not appear empty-handed. Now, what's interesting, those three feasts are usually replete with a lot of giving as it is, but it says they shall not appear empty-handed before me. And I took this, this Hebrew word down. The Hebrew word is rekyam. It's, if you're interested, Strong's 7387, which is emptily, void, or without cause. The Hebrew noun developed from a cognate from the Akkadian, reku, but here's the interesting thing. The noun appears 12 times in the Old Testament, used repeatedly to describe the vanity of human plans and efforts in the face of God's will. Not only that, the adverb carries the meaning empty, without reason, or in vain. So why was it important for God to tell the people to not appear empty-handed? I'm going to tell you why. It wasn't about the substance. It was an act of worship. Failure to make this connection is failure to get the whole message. If you separate giving to God, participating in his program, and making it, this is just a money thing, you fail to understand what God really wants. He wants you. He wants all of you. But he doesn't want all of you so that you can live some monastic life. He wants all of you so that he can change you into the image and likeness of his dear son, which also represents the greatest giver of all times. I cannot say that I have achieved the level of giving that Christ did as he gave himself sacrificially for me, nor can anyone in this room say that. But we can all say we understand and look to that, and I understand what's been done for me, so I do understand I owe a debt that I could never repay. What is that worth to me? Everything. God could have decided to pass me over, to not even bother, with, could have passed you over and not decided to wake you up, and, not, and decided, you know what, that one I don't want. And you might say, how could you say that? Well, if you read Greek, the book of Ephesians says, God chose out from among some, from amongst others. Basically, God chose who he wanted, and he didn't want everybody, even though the earth is the Lord's, and all the people in the earth and on the earth are his. He doesn't want everybody. If you read Greek, look up Ephesians 1. You'll see what I'm talking about. If you don't read Greek, you'll just have to take my word. So with that being said, I'm going to ask you a question. I asked it last week. Has God changed? No. That's about 50% of you. Has God changed? No. But we have. We've changed. We think we've evolved. We think we have moved forward. But in reality, I'll tell you what. All you've got to do is look at the birth of this country. The birth of this country was birthed on religious freedom, the desire to worship God freely, which is now treated as, meh, who, who, who wants to bother with God? We've got more important things to do. What, I don't know. So I think where I'm going is to say maybe God's practices and prescriptions have changed, but he has not. He still wants the same thing. From cover to cover in this book, he wants us to trust him and take him at his word. I'm not asking you to trust me. That, any human that says, trust me, go the other way, all right? Because we're human and we can do what only humans can do. But when God says, take me at my word, 
that's something for you to stop and think long and hard about, that God's not going to change his word. He's not going to change himself. The scripture says, I am God and I change not. So here are a few things I want to talk to you about that I think will make sense and congeal at least the premise of where I'm going. I mentioned the rich young ruler, so maybe we should even turn there for me to point this out. I'm looking at it from Matthew 19 and verse 16. And I want to point this out because it's, it's something incredibly important that sometimes I think even I have failed to communicate. So Matthew 19, beginning at verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, of course, Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There's no, no good but God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things I've kept from my youth, my youth up, what lack I yet? And this is the thing that I'm telling you to pay attention to. It's not the money. Every person will have something different. So you fill in the blanks of what it might be for you. But he says to him, if you will, go and sell what you have, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. Jesus says to his disciples, verily I send to you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven, or that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. There's something I want to show you, though, that's so, it's in your face. He says, I've checked the boxes, Jesus. I've done these. I've checked every box. Now, I'm not suggesting. I'm just, this is something to think about. There are a lot of people out there just like this rich young ruler. They'll say, but I pray and I fast and I do this. One thing you lack, whatever that one thing might be. And you know what? I do not believe that people need to hear audibly. I believe that if the Spirit of God is in you, you'll get an impression, something that leads you to do a little bit of self-investigating to find out that there's something there and only you and God can work that out. I can't do it for you. But just the fact that this man had checked the boxes was not enough. And this is what I'm telling you about giving. Some people think if they just check the box, it suffices. But God who sees the heart, I don't. No one can except for him. He's not wanting box checkers. He's wanting sincerity. He's wanting true devotion, true worship. And that comes part and parcel. If you're going to follow him, you better follow him 110% with the heart. doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. But you put your heart 110% into following, trying to listen to what's being said and not become the, the quintessential box checker that says, well, I've done that, and I've done that, so enough done here. God, what are you going to do for me? It doesn't work like that. Now, there's another passage that I want to juxtapose this with. That is in Luke 19. I want you to see the difference between these two men because then the juxtaposition, the comparison, or the opposites become evident. So Luke 19 basically is the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, tax collector, right? Money, 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 IRS man, right? Call him that. And he was rich. Well, then we'll call him a government official. He worked for the government. <laughs> See, only, only in this country can you go in as a junior senator, getting a junior salary, and come out a multimillionaire. Only in America, friends. OK, so we call them publicans, right? And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. Well, if we could not for the press, he was a little man, right? So he had to climb up a tree to see Jesus coming through. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide in th at thy house. I'm going to tell you what. 
if that doesn't tell you that God knows each and every one of us, he may not have called your name audibly heard, but if that doesn't tell you that he knows each and every one of us, like the scripture says, he knows the hairs on your head, and you bald folks, don't be complaining, all right? <laughs> uh, let me just tell you, that speaks volumes to me. Even this, I, I, ca I cannot read the Bible for as long as I've studied it and not recognize that you could put your name where Zacchaeus' name is when he called your name and found you wherever you were. He didn't say, go clean up and then come in. He said, you, come on. So he made haste, came down, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he's gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. <laughs> and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Take the two men, the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus, box checker, religious man, spiritual in appearance, but not able to hear the voice of the Lord, spiritually speaking, not able to connect. Here is this man, a cheater perhaps, whatever you want to call him, but the picture is painted as a man who'd probably be corrupt, and yet he could hear, receive, and act on the words of Jesus. So what I'm saying to you is, with God, it is what happens inside. All of these exterior functions we do, you know how people get very sanctimonious and very ceremonious about everything. God could care less about that. I was talking to somebody last week, and uh, I'm just going to tell you, for those of you who know me, I am just like you. I speak where the rubber meets the road sometimes, maybe a little bit too much. We'll leave that one up to your interpretation. And somebody was shocked at some uh, suggestive, perhaps, language that I used, and I said, why are you shocked? That's who I am. I'm not a hypocrite. Now, God is still working on it. Didn't I say God's still working on me? God didn't call me to be a Puritan or to uh, make the example that we should all walk a certain way while I do something else. I'm just like you, working it out with God, and I have make no qualms about saying that. So that person had an, a, an erroneous idea that somehow I should stand on a soapbox and I should be perfect. And I said, there's nobody perfect except Jesus Christ. Don't lay that trip on me. I'm working it out just like you. So I'm telling you, I juxtapose these two people because it speaks volumes to me. Now, there are those people who will say that giving in the New Testament is optional. So let me show you something else to show you it's not optional. Turn to Matthew 6, and I only want to highlight two four-letter words. Oh, boy, that's going to be good. <laughs> if you said that in any other conversation, they'd be saying, really, Pastor Scott? Okay. Matthew 6, and I only want you to look at two words, verse 2, and I want you to read verse 2 along with me. So it's the sixth chapter, the second verse. Therefore, don't hear any of you. Therefore, when. That's the four-letter word, when. And it's repeated again in verse 3, but when. So let me read the context for those people who are, don't have Bibles right now. Take heed that you do not your alms, and we've translated that many times before, don't think it is what you think it is, before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, it doesn't say if you do, it says when. And then, so when you doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, like as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I send to you, they have their reward. But when, not if, when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. Now let me stop there to talk about that. So a couple of things, and it's pretty important. As I said, read those little four-letter words real carefully. It doesn't say if, if you like, if it's possible. It says when you do these things, when you practice giving. And there are two different words for giving. It's not, I'm not going to do translation today. If you've been here, you know what they are.
But I'm just going to tell you this. This don't let your right hand know what your left hand. A lot of people don't understand this. You know, if you think about it, don't let your right hand know what your left hand. How's that possible? What that is saying is don't get puffed up in pride with your own giving. In the time I've been around this ministry, which is more than 17 years, I have seen more people puffed up. They have to make a statement about their giving, and they have to make it so that everybody can hear. Not letting your right hand know what your left hand is doing is basically saying, don't get caught up with yourself. You do it, do it unto the Lord, and you just do it. Don't make a fuss. He says here, if you are trying to get applause of men, that's going to be your reward down here. That's all you're going to get for this giving. You're not going to get any reward from the Father. It's just what it is. So it's very important that giving does not become a prideful act. Let me stop for a minute here and tell you a, a very short story which some of you are familiar with. Because, you know, when you have this old of a ministry, which basically some of you know the ministry was birthed here, not in this building, but somewhere else in 1964, which tells you how far it goes back. I uh, wasn't born yet. Good job. Just sneaking it in there, okay? So I'm not that old. But you can imagine that you, over the years, I've heard the stories before my time, during my time, and now in my time. So not too long ago, while we were, and most of you know we had a public legal battle that was ongoing for a long time, a person who used to be considered themselves a participant here plastered over the internet how much they gave and they gave and they gave the proceeds of their house. I, I'm sorry. Did, did you not read what the Bible says? The minute you start broadcasting what you did, the act of your giving has been negated. So this person is, oh, I gave this and I gave that. <laughs> well, okay. Uh. Wow, that's all I have to say. But for somebody who actually said they read the Bible, it blows my mind that you'd actually plaster that or you would discuss and make a spectacle of yourself so that other people could say, oh, you're so righteous, you did that? When you do these things, you basically have to put a little thought. Now, I'm not gonna tell you, even though Jesus says give in secret, do what you do, not everything in the Bible was done in secret. Let me show you something out of Acts, the book of Acts. And again, here are two distinct things that are put together side by side for a purpose. So in Acts, we're looking at, I believe, the fourth chapter. The brain is working pretty good today. Sometimes it cooperates and sometimes it doesn't. Fourth chapter, and read about, I'll start here with uh, verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and the distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite. There's a little subtle reason why they put that in there. And of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. That tells you his giving wasn't in secret. It was a known thing that he did it. So what I'm saying to you is exercise caution. You can still do things that people may be aware of. It's not like we're, we're running around again. Okay, nobody better see me. I'm getting, to, I'm getting to the place where I'm going to put my money in. Okay, nobody better see me. We're not talking about that. We're talking about don't make it into theater. You're not supposed to make it into showtime. Okay? So... Put that in context with this age-old story of Ananias and Sapphira. Because if you read what they did, there's actually, you can actually put these two side by side. It says here, a certain man, beginning in chapter 5, named Ananias, and with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, kept back a part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of thy land? What, what they were doing is they were engaging in spiritual hypocrisy to make themselves look bigger and better givers than they really were, but in fact they were saying, now we'll, we'll, we'll make the show of what we've done, but we're going to hold back 
most of it for ourselves. I'm wanting you to see the clarity with which God focuses in like a magnifying glass on these people. And you don't think that happens today where people will try and kind of do the same thing? I'm super spiritual because I do this, blah, 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 blah. No, you're not. You've just made a spectacle of yourself. And chances are you're puffed up in spiritual pride because you want everyone else to know, except for the main audience, who really is your only audience. God. What about God? What about the relationship? In my opinion, anyone who practices like this, they betray God's trust by basically saying, it doesn't matter what you think, I'm more concerned about what everybody else thinks. Find me a person who's more concerned with that than with him. And I'm going to tell you that person will be very destitute spiritually. I'm more concerned about what God thinks about me. When people have come against me, whether they sing my praise or they curse me, I'm only concerned with one audience, and that is what does he think of me? What does God think of Melissa Scott? And God, please look in my heart, which he does, because there's a lot of people who would say the exterior, the exterior. I don't care about that. Neither does God. He's looking for, I've said this before, authentic Christianity, an authentic relationship. Now, imagine if we put the same practices to prayer or to fasting, which is why Matthew 6 has those grouped together. Imagine if we went around telling, well, today I'm going to pray that uh, you might get blessed. You're talking to God. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to an audience or are you talking to God? Now, Indulge me for a minute and pretend that you could be sitting right by God's right-hand side, looking down and watching the spectacle. I think if I was God, I'd probably be like, where's the bag? <laughs> okay? So, we've seen enough of that. Show me the authentic you. Show me that you're able to understand what God wants. He wants you to have an authentic relationship with Him, which means you don't hold back with Him. I am not suggesting that people give everything away like they did in the, in the New Testament, I am suggesting you begin by giving your heart. That's the starting place. If your heart is open and it is open to Him, God will enter in and He will, he will show you, and I say that by the urgings and leadings of the Spirit, by the Scriptures, how. Now, one of the least reported topics on giving, think about this. If you remember in John 6, remember when John fed, uh, when Jesus fed the multitudes? And they said, look, there's a little boy who's got some loaves and fishes, right? We just automatically assume that they went over and said, oh, look, there's a boy with loaves and fishes. But the kid or the lad or the boy still had to give them up. Does, has anybody ever thought of that? He still had to give them up. He didn't just go like, a, it's a holdup. Give us the bread and the fishes, right? <laughs> He still had to give, there, nowhere does it say, there's no discourse about the boy, except, oh, look, there's a boy over there. Oh, okay, let's go get, right? But that person, that, that individual still had to say, yes, Lord, it's all yours. I think I've thought about this many times. The little that that person gave was enough to, to feed and fill an entire congregation. This is what makes me cringe. People who come, they do all the talk, but when it's time to participate, and when I say feed the congregation, I'm not talking about food, I'm talking about the bread of life. So it's vitally important that each person understands, even in the passages where there is no mention of giving, there is giving. Go back and read about this boy. There's nothing that says they asked, they took, but he had to give it. And that gift was multiplied. Do I believe that every gift is multiplied? No, not necessarily. But that one was. And I don't know whose gift will be multiplied. That's up to God to do. I'm not the bestower of, of blessings. He is. And I believe there are some people that give sacrificially, and the blessing they receive is not the tangible kind. Anyone who says it's a quid pro quo, go the other way. Anyone who says it's like an investment scheme, if you give a little bit, God will give back. God blesses us in ways 
that are ineffable and not tangible. Many times the blessing does come. Trust me, the beginning of the transition in 2005, I've told you this too, at the height of Dr. Scott's ministry, and for the old timers who remember, we're talking about in the 80s. What, it, what would be a million and a half dollars from the 80s today? I don't know what that translates to, but that was what the budget was in the 80s for this ministry. Can you even multiply that to today's factor today? And I can tell you something, we don't take in that amount of money. Somehow, just after he passed, I think a lot of people got freaked out. They stepped back and they said, oh, well, I'm, I, I'm out, count me out. I'm going to wait and see what happens here. She's going to probably sink, and I don't want to be part of the ship, so I'm leaving. So I had a good probably, I don't know, it was a year or two years of trying to figure out how to keep everything going and not miss a beat with a lot of people missing in action. Guess what? I, and I still don't know how, but the Lord made a way. And it was, I kept saying every day, the Lord will make a way, the Lord will provide, it'll come, people will come. And let me tell you something. I wasn't scared because I realized something. This is his work. It's not my work. I didn't start it. I probably won't finish it. So if it's his work, his hand is on this work, he's able to know exactly what this ministry needs, how to make people understand, how to grow, how to thrive, and how to, most importantly, faith enough to know God will make a way when, even when we cannot see it. I'm standing here today as a testament to that. If you can kind of indulge me to say this, I think looking back in retrospect, I wish some of those people that ran away in fear, I wish they would have been along for the ride. It's been bumpy, but it's been the most amazing 17 years of watching what only God can do. I remember hearing people, and you've heard me, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, people saying, this woman can't preach herself out of a paper bag. Yeah, they may have been right, but God can take anyone and turn them into his mouthpiece. Just look at Moses. You look at all the people he chose. None of them said, hey, I'm a professional speaker here. You better pay me the right price. <laughs> Most of them said, who am I? I can't speak. What am I going to say? What do you want me to say? I don't even know what to say. God said, you just stay the course, and I'm going to see you through. So what I, as my message to you is a hodgepodge of giving and faith today, I'm going to leave you with this thought. God will never leave you in a position where you cannot go through for his purposes and can't carry out his will. If your heart is towards him, even when it comes to giving, you know the worst words I hear? Somebody says, I don't have anything to give. I don't have enough money to give. Oh, spoken by the same person who goes out and buys a lunch at Burger King or something, whatever. I don't know what fast food costs because I don't eat it, but it's pretty darn expensive to eat fast food. Trust me, that same person who will waste money on other things, but to God, I don't have enough money. Let me tell you something. You cannot afford to not give. If you're a Christian, I'll say it one last time. Giving is intrinsic to your Christian faith. Failure to make that connection is what I call arrested development. You're not going to grow. You're not going to advance. Why? Because there's an element missing. It's just like every other component of faith. It all has to come together. You may start on a wobbly ground and uncertain, but God will make a way for you. And as a living testament, I'm telling you, God has never let us down here at Faith Center. The promise is he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So when it comes to giving and the faith walk, the same thing is true. He makes a way for all of us. It's up to us to say, yes, Lord, and here I am. I want to participate. Now, we are not taking up an offering as in bags, but there are chests planted all over the place and a box around the front. If you brought an offering, knock yourself out. If you're still one of those people sitting on the fence, I strongly urge you to go to the network and educate yourself. I am not here to raise money to reach into your pockets. I'm wanting people to know why the purpose of God's reason that we should participate, not just say, give, give, give. Here are the reasons why I'm laying them down by breadcrumbs in simplicity. For those that are interested, keep watching 
it might become clear as to why this is a very important subject to God. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.